Joining us now on Practical 365 is, well, Practical 365, Tony Redmond. Hi, Tony. How are you? Hey, Steve. How's it going? Not bad. Now, I'm not going to ask you to introduce yourself because every reader of the site should know who you are. And, well, I asked uh, the GPT-4 model who the most prolific Microsoft MVPs are, and you were top of the list. So um, mm. we're going to talk a bit about Copilot, though, not not necessarily chat GPT. Um, but first, we're going to talk about your session with Greg. Have you had a chance to watch the interview uh, with Greg the other day yet? No. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't want to prejudice the conversation that I have <laughs> with him on stage. Um, he is utterly convinced that um, whatever you discuss, he's going to come out on top. Um, but is he is he going to assault me or something like that? <laughs> uh, well, what what would you like to happen? Um, so you're going to be at Tech oh, I think we're going in to have September. A debate. Um, I, I mean, Greg, Greg's a Microsoft guy. Yes, okay, so that's the first thing. So he is from the the myths of the empire, and he is coming out with all of the. Uh, attitudes that people who work for the empire have. So that's great. He well, is more human than most. He did people. say um, he was going to go against the grain with other people at Microsoft, you know, sometimes do and say on-premises isn't dead. Yeah, but he doesn't get to vote and uh, <laughs> very much. And um, if you look at the investments that Microsoft is making, I think a lot mm. of customers will say that, the evidence is in the hard cash that's being devoted to to servers. And I, you know, Microsoft is making incremental improvements, but they're very incremental improvements to Exchange Server. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard of much happening in SharePoint Server for the last while, so I don't know what's what's happening there. But it just seems that uh, Microsoft is using the on-premises customer base as a convenient reservoir of potential uh, targets to upgrade to Microsoft 365, and that's about it. I, you know, I, I think it's probably fair to say that every on-premises customer um, that doesn't move to the cloud is probably seen as a loss by Microsoft, even though they're using and paying for Microsoft software. Um, I'm not sure they call it a loss. I'd say it's more like it's, a, a, it's an opportunity that has not been realised yet. Yes, it's a pro source of profit that will be will be taken onto the books in the future. Uh, I I I think you see an attitude, and customers share this, right? That they'd like to go to the cloud and do certain things, but for whatever reason they can't. And when Microsoft do X, Y, and Z, whatever that customer really needs to be able to tick a box or get the the right user experience if they've got to go and do a bunch of complicated stuff, yeah. then they'll then they'll be able to go. It's almost as if it's a matter of time. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I think some for some customers it's going to always be very difficult. I mean the cloud involves so much uh, basic infrastructure that you've got to have. You've, you've got to have this great internet connectivity, for example. And there are some people who just can't have that for, mm -hmm. for, for, for different reasons. There's some people who, you know, who just need to run these servers on-prem. Now, I, I will say that I don't think you can compare on-prem to the cloud. You used to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. In 2011, you could you could compare the two. Third, uh, Twelve years later, I don't think you can. Just huh. the cloud is so different. It's so much more capable. The amount of investment. I mean, Microsoft said in the last, uh, in their last quarterly call, earnings call, that the investment they made in that quarter for building out their cloud infrastructure was 10.7 billion dollars that's a lot of money and that that speaks to the amount of servers and network gear that's used to to power the cloud so it's very difficult to compare that kind of infrastructure versus an on-prem environment yeah but i think that's not what 
the on-prem customers want. They don't want Microsoft to give them exactly the same as is available in the cloud. That would be unreasonable. It would be impractical. It's not going to happen. But I think they just want to see a little bit more effort on the part of Microsoft. You know, there was a glimmer, for example, when uh, OAuth uh, authentication started to become available for uh, um, on-premise customers because, you know, basic authentication is as bad a scourge for on-prem customers as it was in the cloud. Yeah. So you kind of, the uh, on-prem customer be, um, could rightly say to Microsoft, well, you know what, you, sp- you poured tons of effort in eliminating basic authentication for Exchange Online. You're, you're, you're putting effort into uh, eradicating it for the office apps. But you're leaving us with, you know, an occasional bone being thrown to us to say, well, yeah, okay, we've got this um, OAuth authentication thing to Bob that, that works with the latest version of Outlook, uh, doesn't work with any other version of Outlook, works in a particular way if you've got yeah. all this environment set up. Oh, come on, guys. Is that the best you can do after uh, in the, after thinking about this problem for the last five years? That's the kind of thing that I think Greg and Greg and I will be discussing at Tech. Well, yeah, I th- um, we'll be debating, and I will beat him into a pulp. It's all, it's great to say I know customers still need to be on premises, um, but yeah, if, if you look at hang on, what what sort. Theoretically, would be past due an exchange server big release, and realistically, when was when was the last fundamentally big change in exchange server? You know, twenty nineteen. Well, twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen, but was it evolutionary or was it? No, it yeah. wasn't evolutionary. It wasn't evolutionary. It was a very good change because it sped up Exchange. Mind you, at that point, uh, uh, to to get the event base, the course meant that all Exchange servers had to be hundred had to have hundred twenty eight gig of of memory. You know, so it's a double edged sword. But, but by that know, point, performance boost. customers are buying all Flash Sans to stick this on anyway. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, but the point is, is that this was announced at uh, yeah. Ignite in twenty eighteen. You know, so we're five years on mm-hmm. and. The amount of change that you get excited about, yeah, in Exchange Server is very little. It's very little, and that to me is a pity. Yeah, it's a pity. Yeah. So that's what we'll be discussing. It'll be a it'll be a fun conversation because uh, you know Greg and I get along well, even though uh, you know we fight like cats and dogs. We still get along well, and we'll we'll. We'll have a good. We'll have a good debate. Um, now, one thing that uh, you did last year at Tech was give some good tips on things to get into if you are looking at where to go next in your career. And Greg said, you know, similar security compliance. Now, yeah. if you were going to take a risky bet for something to uh, really start learning about, where would you? Where would you say that people should look? Uh, the graph. Graph managing the graph, uh, programming with the graph. Funny enough, Greg thing. said that too, but he would, wouldn't he? Um. Well, I, I mean, I've been over the last year. I think I have spent more time talking to uh, graph developers than anybody else to try yeah. and understand this better because I really get into the the, the Microsoft Graph uh, PowerShell SDK. Um, I had ignored it for a while, and then I got into it. And I found, you know, this is a really good thing for any tenant administrator to have uh, knowledge of because it just because it's based on the graph. It opens up everything that the graph has, but in a PowerShell way, which is a lot easier than writing hardcore uh, graph API requests. So I think it's a now it's in the SDK v2 is out. It's still got some weird things that you have to bear in mind. It's it's it still works in an odd way from time to time, but I still believe that this is a fundamental tool for uh, for any tenant admin to to have at their fingertips. Now, I was going to ask you about Copilot, but I don't know whether you use them yourself. But GitHub Copilot is equally good at PowerShell, 
if you are uh, an admin who's looking to if you, you dive in and you, you forget the best way of doing something and you'd otherwise search the internet yeah. for an answer, just, you know, best way of uh, validating some arguments or checking yeah, that a yeah. file exists and so on. Uh, do you, have you used it yourself? Uh, no, because most of the time, well, firstly, because I'm ancient mm-hmm. and I have barely managed to move on from uh, Notepad <laughs> to Visual Studio co- Code. So um, that would be the first reason why. And the second reason. It works with it. You'll love it, Tony. Yes, I know that. You like, put a comment in and talk what you want it to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Look, (laughs) the great thing about any of these AI tools is that they can regurgitate, Mm -hmm. but they can only regurgitate what has gone on in the past. And a lot of the stuff that I tend to work on is new stuff. So I tend to be one of the first people that's poking at a particular SDK commandlet and nobody else can tell me why the commandlet works in a particular way. So if I was to ask Git, GitHub Copilot, yeah. you know, how does this SDK commandlet work? It's going to give me a, a blank. Absolutely. Because yeah. nothing has been done before. Uh, but that, the, the bit of code that you wrote above that you either copy and pasting in from something you've done before or, um, or you just haven't done it Steve, that way. Steve, I know for how to cut and paste. I know. I'll just say, it's, it's, it's a time save. I have a library of thousands of, of uh, bits of PowerShell. I'm, I'm pretty good at being able. I'm my okay. own little co- <laughs> I'm my co-pilot for Tony Red and PowerShell, by the way. Thank you very much. So talking of co-pilots, though, you're going to do um, what seems like a risky bit, really, a, a session on co-pilot at Tech. Yep. I plan to talk about the ins and outs, the rounds and abouts of Microsoft 365 Copilot. Uh, at tech yeah it's it's risky in one way because we don't have generally available software yeah but there's been enough clues given by microsoft and enough enough information that is available to be discussed without violating ndas Mm -hmm. where you can start talking about the basics i mean the, the basics of generative ai are well known so if you go and you apply the basics of generative ai in, in a way that leverages the information that's stored in um, Microsoft 365 and Exchange and SharePoint and Teams and so forth and so on, you can figure out pretty quickly what's good and what's bad, or what's good and what's likely to be good and what's bad and what's likely to be bad in Copilot, Microsoft 365 Copilot. Yeah. And I think that, but the session is not intended to talk about a feature blow by blow description of what Microsoft 365 Copilot will do and how it will revolutionize the world of working and how that $30 per user per month is an absolutely, totally justified bargain. I won't talk about that kind of stuff at all. What I want to talk about is to try and get people to think about how the Copilot ecosystem is built and how Because you've got to understand the basic technology to be able to understand how it's likely to work in your environment. Microsoft, it's like any other piece of technology that they're building. They build stuff that's generalized. They build stuff that's able to work in banking, in insurance, in manufacturing, in medical tenants. Okay, the people in those tenants know what they do. They know the, what the, how their business work. They know how their users work. They know what their uh, business goals are. So they've got to be able to take technology to generalize and make it specific to them, make it work specifically for them. Otherwise, they're never going to get back the, the investment for that horribly expensive $30 per month. Well, Microsoft are so ex- that's ex- what we're going to be talking about. And Microsoft are expecting partners and probably customers as well to build industry specific or company specific co-pilot add-ons that do those really clever things so that for the legal industry and so rather than building them on another platform or OPSI or open ai or maybe even both you know it really depends on who you speak to or what day of the week yeah, it you is you have to understand the basic technology Absolutely. add-ons are useless unless you can understand the basic technology so I want to talk about the basic technology. And this is a thing, you know. I want to know. talk about the, some of the decisions that people have got to make as they consider whether or not Microsoft 365 Copilot is a technology that, they're, that they can make use of. And I think there's, there's a lot of people who have read 
bits about it, understand the phrases to use. But then when it, when it's explained how it will work, um, perhaps uh, need to un- have that base understanding um, because they're expecting it to be perhaps trained against your tenant. And what mm. the base, uh, someone said, the base model, oh, that's like a, a newborn baby then, is it? It knows nothing. And it's, it's, a, it's somewhat of a, it's a complete misunderstanding, really, of, of how it all works. So that's useful information. If you, you know, if you've just read articles here and there, or you've read really super complex stuff that it's just you just don't have time for, then it'll be useful to get a a good appraisal of that. But you know, what, what's the biggest thing to be worried about? Is it you know? I saw your one of your recent articles where you hit on a really good point, which is it's, it's the the same old junk in, junk out. If you've got bad data. Mm-hmm that's going to generate bad stuff. But is there anywhere else, you know, chat GPT, for example, can generate mm-hmm. some very bad things mm-hmm. um, or v- very incorrect things. It, you know, mm-hmm. things that look good until you read them. Even if you give it the right information to start with. What's the right information? You give it, let's say, um, let's say I took an article by you and I said, rewrite, you know, write me a summary of this. Mm-hmm. Don't use anything else. Don't yeah. You know, be accurate. Only stick to the, the right terms. It could still go wrong, oh, and good. yeah, and that that concerns me about Copilot as well because it's going to have some parameters um, for how it will be creative or not that will be baked in but not visible to you as a tenant admin or a user, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean the 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 term rubbish in equals rubbish out. Holds um, holds true with an additional rider in that not only can rubbish be introduced in, but the processing performed by the AI can produce extra rubbish mm-hmm. because we're talking about generative AI. Generative means I create stuff. Yes. And the thing is, is that generative AI can create stuff which is wrong which is very wrong, which is absolutely wrong and horribly wrong. So if you provide if you provide a bad data set for Copilot to work against, and a bad data set is, for example, documents that are factually incorrect. Yeah. Now you don't know that they're factually incorrect. They may have been drafts of documents that you wrote months ago about a particular subject. About about Contoso. You wrote some uh, some assessment about the Contoso Corporation that contains all sorts of factually incorrect articles because you went to bad websites or whatever. Anyway, you've got you've got a couple of documents that describe Contoso in these terms, and they're in your SharePoint, mm-hmm. or they're in your OneDrive or whatever. And you then go along and say to Co- uh, Copilot, hey, Copilot, go and find me uh, information about Contoso and summarize it and give me an update report of where we're at. Well, can, Copilot can take that, that request, which is a perfectly logical request. It can then do all of its grounding to try and make sure that the request is reasonable. It can then execute graph commands to go and find the information and bring it all back and then try and make sense of it through some of its foundational models that basically tell us how to parse these documents out and make sense of them. Yeah. But at the end of the day, because you know some of the some of the information was flawed, Copilot is just going to be like a parrot, and it's going to repeat that information. Mm-hmm. It may repeat it in a nicer term, nicer way. It may repeat it in a more cogent method way. It may generate text that flows beautifully, but at the end of the day, it's wrong. Yes. And this is the difficulty. It's the difficult. Humans can probably recognize that information is incorrect. Because if you went to a document that's in your, uh, in a SharePoint uh, document library, and you picked it out and said, here, I'll, I'll use that as the basis of, um, of my update for my management team, and you were reading it through, Alarm bells will probably go off as you read some of the stuff that you had written, say, six months ago. Yeah. You say, geez, how did I write that? Where do they get that information? I know myself that that's factually incorrect. Yeah. But Copilot, being, you know, 
a computer program being a computer program that's told to make sense of this information, but is not being asked to judge the validity of the information because it doesn't know. Remember, it's not going to go and, and go go and co as research Contoza for you. It's going to do it against the information that's available to you as the user. And it's this, going to take that information and produce crap. And there's a there's a common sort of misconception as well that because it it's been trained against public data, then that's great because it can use that. But the point is, it's not when you use it in Copilot, it's against your data. The fact that it's trained yeah. against that is so that it can use well, that model to guess the next word better yeah. than, but only against your, your information. So it doesn't check whether it's right, right. necessarily. Yeah, I think you're talking there about the foundational yeah. models, these foundational LLMs, which, which basically tell Copilot how to deal with requests that are coming in and how yes. to make sense of them. But it doesn't help provide, it provide valid information out the back of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. But it's not going to. Your point is well made. If it if it goes to your uh, your 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 digital file cabinet and find all sorts of rubbish, oh boy, it's going to love that information because it's got information to work with. But the information isn't going to get any better as Copilot processes. And you've worked in large organisations before. You know, people don't always read stuff before they send them out. You know, you look at them and they've copied and pasted them and it's got another customer's Correct. name in and things like that. And Correct. that's the hard thing, isn't it? Because when something looks all right, and I don't know whether you've seen people, they're doing presentations, they'll show generative AI making a, a photo. And I don't know if you've seen Will, Will, a gif of Will Smith eating spaghetti. It looks like Will Smith, but it's completely not. It looks terrible. And you can, you can almost demonstrate how bad these things are when you look at, at photo generation where you've got to give it a lot of information and train it well for it to be able to generate something accurate. And thankfully, as people, you can see the difference instantly between good and bad. Um, mm. But without that, you know, without being able to instantly see something, it's quite difficult to get under the hood and and see whether it, you know it's going to be good. Because you, are you really going to give it three tries and read through every single different um, idea it comes up with? Well, I no, you're you're right. I think I think some users will accept what Copilot gives um, and and says yes, that is the word that has been handed down from the mountain. That's what I'm going to use because AI hey, could never make a mistake. You'll have other users who will be innately suspicious of it and will check every detail and will find the problems. But will they be able to fix the problems? Will they be able to yeah. fix the problems with Copilot? I don't think so. If the is flawed, they will be able to edit the output information and make changes to it, in which case I'm saying to myself, well, why didn't you do that yourself in the first place? Well, this is going to be the, the proof in the pudding part of, of the real value of it because tacitly there's something that people see as being valuable at the moment, right? But mm -hmm. executives know it could be, but they're, it's a bit like, I'm not going to say... I don't mean it is a bit like Yammer, but Yammer, theoretically, it's great. And then you use it badly and it's a big flop. You have to try really hard to use it well for it not to be terrible in some cases, or you're used to at least. And that yeah. this, this well, could you can be... Make the same point. You can make the same point for Teams. Yes. I mean, gosh knows... But who Teams did meetings. As it's saving grace, yeah. you could just do meetings in it, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You can get great value there. I was just thinking, you know, about the the recent change where Microsoft introduced this um, this ability for a team to have a thousand channels, and think to myself, who's going to do this? People moving from Slack. Who's going to get lost in this forest of channels? People moving from Slack. Because oh, God love a, a Slack workspace is like one team with loads of channels, and people want that. Rightly or wrongly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, there's people out there that do want these things and they'll do it. And But if, 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 if that's the only reason why Microsoft introduced a team with a thousand channels, I ask myself, you know, why do you go and replicate the worst thing about a competitor product just to, just to bring people over? 
Because that makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm using one I've heard from a customer, and they've been trying for years, and Microsoft's been trying for years to get, get them to, to move over, and it's always been little things like that. Um, it's a bit like the on-premises question, you know, little things that they need to do. But I, yeah. I think in the, the context of Copilot, there is, is it, it, it's got a, you've got, you've got to be able to present some immediate value, right, out of this when you trial it with the people. Everyone is probably going to put their hand up in some organisations and say, "I want in yeah. on this," and your execs are as well. They're going to be, they're probably going to want their PAs on the POC, and yeah. If you just leave them to it, what could happen? Well, when people ask me this, I reflect on, I said, tell them, you know all those Microsoft videos you watched for the launch of Copilot? Those executives were coached to within an inch of their life. The information that you showed, they, you, they showed to you was very carefully selected. It was curated. It was matched to make sure that they produced wonderful results. And ask yourself this, in the real world, will all of your executives or all of your users be, be coached at that level of expertise? Will all of the information that they're going to use be as perfect, flawless? Oh, absolutely not. Content? I know your stuff would be, Steve. No, no, no. But from, okay. from real life customers, though, who are doing Azure OpenAI things now, then where they're trying to create accurate information out the back of it in industries like, you know, insurance, construction, professional services, and so on, they are, I think you even point out those are like legal, engineering, they, these kind of customers are the natural clients that want this stuff. Yeah. There's an enormous where amount precision, of work. Where precision is valued yes yes then there's, yeah absolutely because it's to do with building something that or queries that are about potential claims or yeah. valuations on i think on sales as well could be a rich area for them because you know when you think about it essentially a lot of what a salesperson does is generate much the same information time after time for different customers yeah a quotation the statement at work. They they tend to follow very, very, very strict formulae. And it's a matter of, well, put in the customer's name here and, get, and, and Bob's your uncle. So I think any area where there's this kind of high reuse of precision information should be pretty good. I just have my worries about the great mass of users who perhaps aren't the greatest in the world curating their own information. I just worry about them. Yes. Anyway, that's what we're going to talk about. I think it'll be an interesting session. I hope people will come to to uh, see us at Tech and, and come listen to the session and they can boo me off the stage at the end of it. I won't mind because I'm... You know, I think it's going to be a, re- a very interesting session by the sound of it because all of that thought, it's not about the technology itself and how Microsoft do it, but it's about all the fundamentals. And it's not how does this work, it's it's what do you need to think about before you jump in with both feet. At the end of the day, the user is king, but the user to be king has got to take care of their own house. Absolutely. It's one of those chances where you could do something that's going to provide massive value if you get it right, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Even if it's for a small select group of people or whatever. Uh, Yep. So Microsoft, uh, you moan about the licensing costs and, well, we, we talk about them because they are expensive. But ironically, people who go and follow your advice are probably going to be the, the, the customers that get most most out of it, right? We'll see. We will when see. We have the we will see. You'll see. Well, yes, that's, that, I mean, that, 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 that's, going to be, that's going to be next year's tech session, isn't it? <laughs> Copilot. Yeah. What went right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Things I did with Copilot that I really wish I had done better. Yes, um, it's been lovely to talk to you anyway, Tony. So, uh, good talk to you, Steve. So, you're going to be talking with Greg about how the Microsoft Cloud killed on-premises servers, and your session on Copilot as well, which is probably one that if you're down for tech, you should uh, sign up for as soon as you can, really, because. Everyone is interested in Copilot, so it's going to be. Everybody's interested it's going to be, in Copilot. It's going to be popular. 
I hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Steve. Good luck.